Hi, I'm Brian Timo, one of the pastors here at Grace Spring Bible Church. We hope this resource is used in conjunction with you being a part of a family of faith where you grow in relationship with God and one another. Having said that, we are committed to resourcing our people well, but to do so, we rely on the gifts of those who believe in what we're doing or who have been impacted by the resources themselves. So if you'd like to make a contribution, you can give through our church app or give online. Now, enjoy the word of God proclaimed. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday morning at Grace Spring Bible Church. My name is Rob Kirschbaum. I'm one of the worship leaders here. And uh, we're excited for, for what the Lord has in store today. Um, I think every time we gather together, we've got an opportunity to uh, engage with, with our God and our friend. And, uh, and, and also to encourage one another. Um, if you're walking around and seeing somebody who's uh, maybe drifted a bit, um, pull them back in. Invite them back into a friendship with with our Lord, and remind them that God is good. I think that's important that we do that each week. So would you stand as we pray together? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your, your kindness, Lord, your grace that, that extends beyond any decision or any action or any thought that we may have had or done. Um, Lord, thank you that you have called us to freedom. And Father, I pray that we would, would use this freedom not as an excuse to walk around in darkness, but Lord, to, to shine brightly the light that you have put in us. Thank you for the gift of life and how you continue to bring that out of death. And Father, today we pray that, that the name of Jesus would be celebrated, uh, that no matter what we might be coming in here with, we would leave with an extra dose of joy. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. chains I'm a prisoner Over 
darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hell. That's when death was arrested, my life began. That's when death was arrested, my life began. Oh, oh your grace so free, wash his own. you moving this morning. This is like warm up too. You might sweat by the end.
gatherings like this, and, and we don't have the opportunity outside of singing to verbally express our love for the Lord. And in the attitude of that song, I thank God, there is so much to be thankful for, right? And so right now, can we as a church family just to give popcorn prayers to God of, Lord, I thank you for and uh, let's just do that as a, as a family. Let's just, let's just pray those prayers up to the Lord right now. Oh, Lord, these thanks. Givings of praise to you could go on all day, and I thank you for that. Lord, thank you for how you're working in the hearts, Lord. I know, Tam and I thank you for us being able to hear from our, our, uh, our, our, our partner in Guatemala. And Lord, just thank you for that little life that we get to come alongside of for the next couple of years. And, and uh, Lord, just thank you for how you have resourced us to be a blessing to so many I just thank you for how many are doing that and how this is just a family of faith that truly wants to put action to our belief system. Lord, thank you for that in your most holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. Wasn't that fun? Just so fun to do that. Um, you know, for those of you who missed last week, uh, you missed an incredible Sunday because it was our Vision Sunday. And last week I was just sharing a little bit about what God has put on our leadership team with regards to our mission statement and, and tweaking it a little bit to be a little bit more, um, I don't want to say palatable, but something that so many, no matter where you are on the Christian journey and following Christ, that you can be a part of this. And so last week we said this, that our mission statement is this. And I want to make sure everybody memorizes it, knows it, because this is what we are about as a church. And that is helping people take a step closer to Jesus. Helping people take a step closer to Jesus. All of us can do that in a variety of ways. What I love about that is here, even on a Sunday morning, as you are preparing to come with the family of faith, um, you, you are preparing your hearts for what's going to take place here. The service doesn't start at the countdown when it hits one, zero. No. The, the service starts when we wake up and prepare our hearts and say, Lord, do something. You, you know, so you, you, you pray prayers that go something like this. Lord, please help people not hear whoever is bringing the word, but hear the Holy Spirit and, and his voice powerfully coming through whoever is bringing the mail that day, so to speak. You understand what I'm saying? Because anyone who opens up the Word of God, we are just the mailman. We are just the delivery system. The message is what we're celebrating, not who the messenger is. It is the message of Jesus Christ. And we are unashamed about that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, wow. Uh, can you toss me some water there, too? I appreciate that. Um, I want us to repeat this mission statement. Thank you so much. I want us to repeat this mission statement, helping people take a step closer to Jesus. So I'm going to ask you, what is our mission statement, okay? So here we go. 
<laughs> yeah, boy, I, you're jumping the gun, and I like that. I like that here about this service. Here we go. What is our mission statement? Let's try that again. Good. I want you to know that. I want you to memorize that because every one of us, each and every day, has an opportunity to help people, help somebody take a step closer to Jesus. And I'm excited about what God is doing here in our midst. And, uh, you know, why this is such an important mission statement is because I don't know if you understand with life, but life at times can be a beat down, right? It can be tough. There are difficult things to go through in life. And I, I think so many times when we're going, especially through those difficulties, there's a whole lot of other voices out there that forces us or at least prompts us to make decisions that are not, aren't the most wise decisions. Have any of you ever made an unwise decision before? Have any of you ever regretted making an unwise decision before? Yeah, I see you online. You got your hands raised. I, I, I see that we've all made poor decisions and I really appreciate a quote that I had heard from a, uh, a pastor of Life Church, Craig Rochelle. He says this, the decisions we make today determine the stories we tell tomorrow. It's like beginning with the end of mind. I think that was a very, very uh, important and I think powerful and true statement that so many of the decisions that we make, um, they can be decisions that lead us to life and freedom or uh, decisions that can lead us to, to tough consequences. And by the grace of God, we have a heavenly Father who desires and loves us enough to say, hey, let me give you some warnings. Let, let me give you just some, some wisdom. And we're going to talk about that today. But there was an uh, allegory uh, written in the 17th century. You may have heard of it. Pilgrim's Progress. The Pilgrim's Progress. John Bunyan. And what I love about allegories is that it's, it's uh, you know, truth put in a very personalized way. And there is a point on the journey that Christian is on his way to the celestial city. And this is a journey that he's on to the celestial city. And along the path, he has different ones who are traveling companions with him. And there was a point in the allegory, in the story, where John Bunyan says that Christian then uh, was partnering with Hopeful. And they were on this part of the journey when it was very difficult. It was windy. It was rainy. The train was just not fun to navigate through. And so they both talked back and forth, and they saw this other path. And they said, that path looks a little bit easier. Let's go and do that path. Well, what they didn't realize is that that, that path um, was on the uh, real estate of the giant of despair. And the giant of despair was sleeping in this real estate until they came alongside the path. He wakes up and he puts them in custody in Doubting Castle. And so they are in the pit of despair in Doubting Castle. And, uh, and both Christian and Hopeful looked at each other and said, how did we end up here? We are on the road to the celestial city. How did we end up here? And how they ended up there was they saw a path that looked a little bit easier, more comfortable. And that is what made the difference. And I think so many times we go through decisions in our life and uh, we have choices. We're confronted with choices each and every day. And I just want to remind us that the decisions we make today determine the stories we tell tomorrow. Now, we are in a portion of the Bible now that is called wisdom literature. Wisdom literature is Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Now, for those of you who are artists and like the poetic genre and, and, and all that goes with that, you love wisdom literature because uh, there is so much poetry in it. Even if you're reading through the book of Job, you see that Job is written in a poetic kind of style. You know, you read through the Proverbs and that has its own kind of rhythm in some of those uh, Proverbs and and, and so it, it's very wise reading to really press into wisdom literature. Now, sometimes you need to be careful with how you read wisdom literature. Because like the Proverbs, Proverbs have a lot of principles in them or precepts in them that aren't necessarily promised outcomes. For instance, 
I've had many people who have just gotten mad at God because he didn't deliver on his promise. And I go, well, what was the promise? The promise was this, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he grows old, he won't depart from that. He said, so we had our child in Sunday school. I, I, you know, we taught the kids the Bible and all that. Well, now they're adults and they have nothing to do with the faith. So God did not deliver on that. And I go, well, hold on, continue to pray for them because I choose to understand what God's word has to say about itself and that it will not return void. So it is always a worthwhile investment to get the word of God. And even while adult children might start making some poor choices and go off other places, they still have that to be able to hold on to. But again, everybody has a choice and choices have consequences and we become a product of the choices we make. And this is why God has given us wisdom literature. And so listen to these kinds of warnings that you hear and these encouragements and admonitions uh, in the Bible. Proverbs 3, uh, 13 to 15 says this, blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding for the gain from her is better than gain from silver and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire can compare with her. I mean, that is a very strong statement. Saying more than gold, more than jewels, more than all of those things you find your security in. It says, no, you pursue wisdom. Parents, you need to continue to come alongside your kids and say, no, you've got to have wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. How about this one? Proverbs 4, 7, the beginning of wisdom is this, and this is get wisdom, and whatever you get, get insight. And so the question is, well, what does that mean? What is the look of that, and how do I get that? That's what we're going to cover today, and we're going to learn from who the Bible calls the smartest man ever. His King Solomon, the third king of the nation of Israel. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, we do have Bibles in the seat back in front of you. Get a Bible. It's on page 332. I want everybody to follow along or turn on your Bibles if you've got that on your phone. But I want everyone to follow along. I'm going to give a little bit of the context here. The context is that King David was about to die, and now the question is, who was going to take over for him on the throne? And so there was a whole lot of backstory that happened within David's family um, that was very heartbreaking. And in fact, the oldest of David's sons, um, Adonijah, he wanted to assume the kingship, and so he then uh, assumes the kingship and has his own ceremony. David catches wind of this and had always said that Solomon, his second son that he had with Bathsheba, that he would follow um, after King David's uh, place on the throne. And so you have David and Nathan the prophet who then place Solomon on the throne. So Solomon is now 20 years old. It's about 970 BC. Okay, so that's about the date. You have the geography of the nation of Israel has never been larger than at the time this 20 year old assumes the role. Now, raise of hands, how many of you would like to follow after the kingship of King David? I mean, it's like Michael Jordan's son going, all right, yeah, I, 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 I'm going to follow after my dad. I mean, that, that is a hard act to follow. And so because of that, that is the context going into um, 1 Kings chapter 3. So if we could stand, we're going to read from verses 3 through 15. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father, Only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. Why did he do that? Because there was no temple yet in Jerusalem. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. 
Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. I want to stop there because all Solomon had to offer was one burnt offering. But he, because he just wanted to have such a relationship with the Lord that his dad did, that he offered a thousand burnt offerings. So I think that sets the stage here for verse 5. It says that Gibeon, the Lord, appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David my father. Although I am but a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people, whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. And then here is his request. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this your great people? I I, I want to pause there because... Have you ever thought about what you would ask for if God says, okay, you've got one wish, one wish, make it count. What would you ask for? What I love about Solomon is he knew he was in over his head. And he said, man, this is too big of a task. And it's because, Lord, of my love for your people, this is the motivation behind my request. I think that is so important to understand here. So reading on. It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. Behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall arise after you. But I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Then he came to Jerusalem and stood before, before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings and made a feast for all of his servants. Why would he do that? I believe he did that because he was so confident that what he had asked for was granted. Folks, this is the word of God. Please be seated. I'm going to get some terminology right because in our culture today, you talk about wisdom and you have a sermon that say, take steps towards wisdom. Um, That can be confusing because of confusion in terminology. And so terminology-wise, wisdom here, according to the scriptures, is the ability to see things from God's perspective. That is true wisdom, seeing things from God's perspective. I believe that becomes so muddied today because for us, we confuse wisdom with knowledge. Wisdom with having the ability to have just so much information. You go, man, that goes so wise. Man, look how well he does in Jeopardy. Man, he's so smart. Man, he he knows all of this stuff. But here what you have is what God's word has to say about this. And just saying wisdom is being able to see things from God's perspective. And, and there's this other uh, term, discernment, discernment. Discernment's important because, you know, wisdom will know where to go to get the answers. Discernment is, is developing almost a sixth sense, so to speak, that you so know not only God's word, but the living God who God's word points you to, that you develop a sixth sense as to what is going to bring God glory in this situation. Because not everything in the Bible is spelled out. For instance, when you're saying, Lord, do you want me to take this job in Timbuktu or this job over here? 
you know, you, you can look and look and look in scriptures and it's not going to say move here. But the principles, the precepts that are in God's word, you start understanding, okay, instinctively, as I'm in tune with God's word, I'm in tune with the Holy Spirit of God who enables me to make wise and discerning choices. So really, this is what Solomon is asking for. Um, and, and, and so the question for all of us is we go, where do we find ourselves in this story? Because this seems to be very unique. You've got Solomon here. He's the son of King David. But what Solomon does here is he does something that the scriptures encourage you and myself, no matter what age you are. The scriptures encourage us to seek after wisdom, to pursue wisdom. So how is it that we are to acquire wisdom? Well, what we see here in this text is that uh, what I love is the vulnerability where Solomon says in verse 7, I, I am but a little child. Well, a 20-year-old is not but a little child, right? You tell your 20-year-old you're a little child, and uh, they're not going to respond too well to that, are they? But what is Solomon saying he is saying, I feel like I just, I don't know anything. I need somebody to teach me. How is it that I'm to be a king to your people, Lord? How is this to happen? See, he has the humility. And I firmly believe humility is the precursor to wisdom. You will never get wisdom if you believe you've got all the answers. See, we, we can't all be teenagers, All right? I, there's nothing like parenting to see the process. You know, I love parenting when our kids were small because they looked to Tammy and I with, wow, you guys have such great wisdom. And then they became teenagers. And then it's like, you know what? You don't know. You just don't know how things work today. And by the grace of God, they're in their, their upper 20s. And at times they ask us for uh, counsel sometimes. It's almost like we've become smarter again. <laughs> but you know, sometimes spiritually we are in a perpetual state of like that teenage stage where it's like, you know what, I got this, I got this, I got this, I got this. And I think so many times even within the church of Jesus Christ, those who call themselves followers of Jesus Christ, you, you, you keep in a very tame, controlled, predictable environment of limiting yourself to those things that you know you can do. Where steps of faith are taking steps where the Holy Spirit prompts you to take a step of faith into a realm that's maybe outside of the normal. I think so many times the Holy Spirit will lead you to the places that you will become like Solomon here of going, I'm in way over my head. And I think you, when you are in over your head, you are in a beautiful spot when it comes to the walk of faith. Because you will get on your knees. You will say, okay, Lord, I need help. You need to see your need for wisdom. If you don't see your need for wisdom, you'll never pray for it. And as we're going to see here in a little bit, God's word calls each one of us to call out to the Lord for wisdom. Second is this, ask God for wisdom. God gave him the opportunity in verse 9. He says, give your servant an understanding mind how to govern your people. And I tell you, God delivered on that prayer. I, I, I started listing all of the different ways that wisdom in, it just took over Solomon's brain. Listen to the roles that Solomon had. He was a governor. Uh, he had ruled now the largest territory in Israel's history. He was a judge. So many times in that role that there would be some complicated disputes that would be brought and you would have to make a decision based in, in, in try to find justice in a situation. He was a builder. I mean, he constructed the temple, the most magnificent temple uh, the nation had ever seen. And, and in fact, it took seven years to build the temple, 200,000 laborers. Um, he was a financial genius. In fact, because of the trade routes, he developed three port cities 
that ended up controlling the trade of the Mediterranean. Because of that, so much gold was coming in that the value of silver was diminished greatly because gold was so plentiful under his leadership. So his financial genius, science, he, uh, he knew botany and zoology in amazing ways. And the, how he would irrigate and all of those kinds of things way ahead of his time. Militarily, he built an army that was nicknamed Can't Touch This. Um, uh, yeah, they were good. They, they were so invincible that nobody dared to touch him. But also, even though he had that military um, prowess, he was an artist and an author. Wrote 3,000 Proverbs. Not all of the Proverbs are recorded in the book of Proverbs, but uh, 3,000 Proverbs. Wrote 1,000 songs. I mean, this guy was absolutely amazing. Have you ever known anyone to have such a breadth of wisdom and knowledge and understanding? So, so much so in 1 Kings 10, uh, the Queen of Sheba from uh, northern Africa comes and visits and is so amazed by what she sees that she says, I truly see God in this. And I tell you, that would be my prayer for each one of us, that we would grow in so much wisdom and understanding of how we navigate through life that it would draw attention not to you, but the God who's living in you and through you. That people would look to your life and go, wow, man, what a great God you have. Oh, I tell you, that's my prayer for us. But then not only uh, an understanding mind, but again, the discernment between good and evil. So he says, that's part of wisdom too, discerning what is a good decision and what is an evil decision. Now, for some of us, we hear the word evil and we just think everything really, really bad. But evil, according to the word of God, is anything that strays from the will of God. And the will of God is firmly established in the word of God. And so anything is evil is making the choice to get off of that path. And God calls it evil because it doesn't lead to your life and your wholeness. And he's your heavenly father, and he wants you to experience life and live it to the full. So, here's where it gets good for you and I. I want you to turn in your Bibles to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. It's near the end of the Bible. And in James chapter 1... I want to, uh, you know, put James 1.5 up here on the screen. James 1.5, you have James, again, the author of one of the 66 books of the Bible that make up the scriptures. James was the half-brother of Jesus. And near the very beginning of the letter, he says this, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. Now, I find that to be one of the most encouraging verses in Scripture, because I want you to parse that out. If anyone lacks wisdom, okay, there's no qualifiers. He says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him do what? Ask God, and God gives generously. He said, wait, 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 that hasn't been my experience. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about this. He gives to all generously, but it doesn't stop there. Because I wouldn't mind if it stopped there, but it's this other phrase that is, makes this so good. And he gives generously to all without reproach. You know what that means? Without lecturing you. Without going, well, it's about time you came to me. Right? I mean, God doesn't do that. He, say, he says, man, come to me. He says, I want to give this generously to you. And I'm not going to nag you. I'm not going to give you a lecture as to why you should have come to me sooner. Or how could you have done that that put you in this situation to have you now finally calling out for wisdom. He doesn't do that. He says, I give to all generously. Isn't that good news? Oh, man, that is great news. 
But here's the context. So many times, it's popular in church world to find a verse like this and not have it fully understood in the context. Do you guys remember what the verses say prior to this? Consider it pure joy when you face trials. You mean this is in the context of, okay, when things don't go well into your life, right? You, you, things are going well, and then all of a sudden, a trial happens. How many of you say, yes, I am so happy about that? Anybody? Well, according to the Word of God, that should be your attitude. He says, consider it pure joy when you go through trials of various times. Why? Because the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Isn't that a wonderful thing to attain to? I want to be perfect and complete. I don't want to be lacking in anything. I want the image of God to be so impressed on my heart that the image of Christ is seen by all who make contact with me. That is my desire. So he's saying that trials are an essential part of chiseling off everything off you that doesn't look like Jesus. So he says you should take joy in this. And when you're not, you should pray for wisdom. You know, there's a story that I heard about a bird flying in the cold. And it's no fun if you're a bird to fly in the cold. If it's cold on the ground, it's really cold up in the elevations that birds fly. Well, this bird got really cold, so cold that this bird crash landed in the snow. Okay? So this bird is freezing to death in the snow. And then something miraculous happens. Cow manure falls onto the bird in the snow. Now, I want you to track with me. True story. And this bird was saved because manure had surrounded and, and, and kept this little bird warm. Isn't that great? And after a while, the bird chirped, and then a cat came and ate the bird. <laughs> so the look of shock that is coming up. Uh, right now is absolutely amazing. But this, this story has a point. Not everyone who drops manure on you is your enemy, right? Not everyone who digs you out is your friend. And when you're in a pile of manure, it's best to keep your little chirper shut. Okay. I've been waiting and waiting to share that. I just figured I'd wait till a warm day, but no, that's, that's the deal. I know I've embarrassed kids, I've, I've embarrassed, uh, but, but anyway, here's the deal. The reason I share that is sometimes we are in situations and we complain about stuff, or we, we speak up too prematurely about stuff, and it is not seasoned with wisdom. So in that context, he says, no, seek the Lord, seek, seek the wisdom of God. But then here is how James 1 continues. He says this, So when you're asking for wisdom, this is hugely important, church. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded, a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Unstable in all his ways. He's saying if you're double-mindedness, if your heart is divided... And you say, well, okay, I'm going to take the word of God kind of like uh, good advice, and I'm going to pick and choose what I want to obey. The word of God is saying, no, here's the deal. When you ask for wisdom, you come to me with your whole heart, and you just, you ask in faith, I will give it to you. In that situation, I will give it to you. Sometimes I counsel and come along frustrated Christ followers who just say, man, I've been praying for wisdom, but nothing's happening. And then I go, well, are you in the word? Well, no, but I'm praying. Okay, well, um, man, are, are you in the family of faith? Are, are, are you exercising what the book of Hebrews 10 says, that don't forsake the assembly? Are you at least gathering with people and maybe not in a larger group like this, or even, but in smaller groups? Are you doing that? Well, no, no, I'm just kind of, no, I'm just, 
going through life on my own. I go, no, it's, it's never intended to be that way. It says, let's come into alignment with what the Word of God says. He says, get in the Word. That's going to point us to the living Word. And, and He's going to inform us. And, and, uh, but, but we cannot be double-minded in our desires. Because, see, it's the Word of God that informs our hearts. Psalm 119.9, how does a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to what? Your word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I will not sin against you. But it's not just the word of God, it's the people of God. The people of God. Proverbs 13.20. Proverbs 13.20 says this, Whoever walks with the wise become wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Leading to the third way we acquire wisdom is to walk with the wise. Walk with those who also are getting into the truth of God's word. Who are allowing the word of God to transform their hearts. Even in circumstances when life doesn't make sense. He says, I'm going to do the hard thing. I'm going to do truth over my feelings. And, and you need to surround yourself with influences that reinforce that. Because today, so many times, that is what gets compromised. Is that, yeah, I'm a Christian. I've been walking with the Lord this many years. Oh, but I don't really have friends that will continue to point me to truth. Every time I start veering off, man, I, I don't have the friends to say, hey, guys, you, you, you need to get back. And I know it's tough. I mean, I've got friends that are doing unwise things. And that's okay. I still love them. But I love them too much not to say anything. I say, you know what? God's word says this and you're doing this. And Well, you know what happens so many times? Okay, well, I'm going to start cutting the communication because I just don't want to hear it. And I go, but you're not getting mad at me. You're getting mad at the Lord. And this relationship is created by God so as to sharpen one another. another. As iron sharpens iron. Well, when iron sharpens iron, sparks fly. Don't be discouraged by that. Continue to press into that. We must walk with wise people. Psalm 1. I mean, the very first psalm, which is, it was really the thesis statement for the entire 150 chapters in the book of Psalms. Psalm 1. It just says, consider who you are walking with. Don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Now again, some of you go, well, you have no idea who I work with. Well, we don't have control over who we work with, but you do have control over who you are going to spend your time with outside of those realms. You need reinforcement. You need people who love you. You need the family of faith. Walk with the wise. So see, see your need for wisdom. Ask God for wisdom. And thirdly, walk with the wise. Well, did Solomon always walk in a wise way. No, he did not. In fact, you go a few chapters later, and already in 1 Kings chapter 11, already, you have 11 and 1. Now, King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh. Now, again, this is not talking prejudice here. This is talking of the Lord himself saying, for my king of my people, when you do that, you are going to start embracing their gods. And sure enough, in verse 4, it says, for when Solomon was old, his wives turned, him, turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God as was the heart of David, his father. A few verses later, he did not wholly follow the Lord as David, his father, had done. But you might say, well, David, his father, had a big, <laughs> he had a big goof. Yes, he did. But he learned from that. He repented of that. And he walked in newness of life from then on. How easy it is to fall into that trap and in the very same way, Christian and hopeful found themselves in the pit of despair, saying, how in the world could we have gotten here? I find so many times that um, we just continue to 
forget the importance of confession and repentance and humbly coming before the authority of Christ and saying, Lord, I'm sorry. You know that's not my heart. I want to come now in alignment with you. And what I love is that God promises to always hear that prayer and say, all right, here you go. Let's get back up. Let's continue on the journey. Let's keep going. But Solomon, he wrote a book in the Bible. It's Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is quite a book because in this time when Solomon started going off the deep end, he, because he had so much money and he had the ability to test everything, he put what he knew to the test in a way that you or I would never be able to do. And at the end of the day, he says, you pursue sex and, and, and sex primarily over the truth of the word, that, that's going uh, it, it, to, it's, it's vanity. It's, it's chasing after the wind. You will have to pursue it more and you'll be more frustrated, more frustrated when you're living outside the, the parameters, the confines of a loving God to say, here's how I designed sex to work. It says you pursue wealth at all costs. It's going to come at a cost. It's going to come at a cost. And then this is how he concludes the book of Ecclesiastes. He's exhausted. The end of the matter all has been heard Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Guys, I tell you, those verses were encouraged to me by a man I respected before I went into college. I was raised and had gone to Christian schools and was in Christian education for years and had just an incredible, incredible church experience. Couldn't imagine a greater youth group and a a greater group of friends. I mean, it was absolutely phenomenal. And I was so excited to go to Oregon State University. I was away from home. I was away from having anybody over my shoulder saying, you will do this. No, I got to make those choices and everything. But here, the, this, this one gave me this encouragement, and, and I took this to heart. Fear God. Man, just fear God. And, and it's not being scared to death of God. It's being so reverential of Him and, and, and respectful of His name that this man then told me, when you go to college, here's what I want to encourage you to do. And this was wisdom talking. He says, I want you to tell as many people as possible that you are a follower of Jesus Christ, like out of the gate. So I did. I get up there. My parents dropped me off. And I am helping people move into the dorms. And I'm saying, hey, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. How about you? You Guys would look at me all weird. Man, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. Man, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Man, I had things on my walls at church, in my dorm, and all this kind of stuff. And the first two weeks, I was probably annoying to everybody because I was telling everybody, man, I'm a follower, I love Jesus Christ. And then I'm on the baseball team, and I'm going, hey, man, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And I, I, I tell you, it was crazy because then I started getting invited to parties, and then I started seeing some of the things happening at those parties, and I say, you know what? I just can't be here. I just can't be here. Why? Because everybody knows I'm a Christ follower. (laughs) And I'm not going to do anything to defame the name of my Jesus. It's not going to do it. Not going to do it. Guys, I tell you, those who are graduating from high school and going into college, man, that was just the greatest advice. It was such incredible accountability. I I, I find many people won't get baptized because they're afraid that they're going to defame the name of Christ. I go, no, get baptized because there's some accountability to that. I follow Jesus Christ. I'm going to give my whole heart to him. So here are my closing statements for us. There is no greater wisdom than ordering our lives according to the word of God. We've got to be a church that continues to get in the word of God, not just for knowledge's sake, but wisdom's sake. So we get to understand God's perspective on any situation. And secondly, the central truth of the word of God is the saving work of Jesus. This is the thread of scripture from Genesis through Revelation. It's a beautiful picture. So now here's what I want to do. I'm going to I'm going to close out, and I want to pray over those of you especially who do not know Jesus Christ in a personal way. 
I, I want us all to bow our heads and I want us all to close our eyes, whether you're online watching or here in person. I, I just, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to pray right now for the one who might be hearing wherever they are, whenever they're listening to this right now, that if they sense the Holy Spirit of God to, man, you don't know the Lord as your heavenly father. I pray that today's the day and the only way to get there is through the work of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. And give your life just he hears the penitent heart saying Lord I need a savior I make a horrible savior but I want to follow after you may may that happen right now let's pray for that to happen right now in the quietness of your hearts You know, if that has happened to you today, share that with somebody. Tell me after service or, or, or online, just say, hey, I raise my hand. That today is the day of my salvation. Do that. But then for those of us who may have been following, but we've gotten off track, um, man, let's pray for one another. Lord, help us do the hard thing, but the right thing. And that is even when the path of life has rain and, and wind and all those elements, may we stay on that path knowing that it's for our benefit what's on the other side of that path for us. Let's pray that for one another. Lord God, thank you so much for today. And as we as a congregation take a step towards wisdom together, Lord, that is truly taking a step towards Jesus Christ in, in deeper, more meaningful ways together as a family of faith. Lord, thank you for the victory that has gone here today. And Lord, help us with the follow through. Help us be wise people who pursue that at all cost, knowing that there is great benefit when we are driven with the fundamental start of where wisdom begins and that is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord. Seeing the Lord for who you are. Lord, may we do that in amazing ways, Lord. We pray these things in your most holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. You know, this is a time where we acknowledge our uh, high school graduates and uh, I'm inviting uh, Jacob Bates up here on stage. He's our GS Youth Director. And uh, tell us what we're doing, buddy. Yeah, man, if you're a high school senior in the class of 2021, come up on stage. We want to recognize and celebrate you guys. Come on up, congratulations. Thank you guys for joining us here today. We know some of you guys couldn't make it. We're celebrating around 16 of you guys. So man, well done everyone. Yeah, scooch this way, we might need some more space. Um, I know a number of these students really well. Um, and man, I'm so proud of you guys. But as I look at your faces, um, I, know I know that you guys know a lot of them too, but, but as I look at you guys, um, you guys don't walk to service opportunities, you run. <laughs> you guys sprint towards them and that's such, um, so it's so encouraging for me. You guys have encouraged so many people here. You've encouraged me. You've encouraged each other. You've encouraged, encouraged your communities, and I'm so proud of you. And uh, wow, you guys have been through a rough year, right? My goodness. Probably one of the easier ones in recent memory, right? But um, we're so proud of you for persevering, for, for keeping the faith, and for moving on. And um, we're excited to continue to be a part of your journey moving forward and just know how proud of we are for you. And so we wanted to um, pray over you guys. We wanted to congratulate you guys. And so church family, would you guys stand? And if you're comfortable with it too, as we pray, if you just raise your hand out over them and uh, yeah, we'd love to pray for you guys. Uh, Father, I thank you so much for these seniors, Lord. I, I thank you for all of the fun that we've had together, Lord. I thank you for all of the, the laughing moments, Lord, uh, the, the inside jokes, the, the hot sauces that we've been able to try and experience together, Lord. Um, Father, I thank you for the tears and the, and the moments of openness and honesty, Lord. Uh, thank you. Father, thank you so much for the blessing that these students have been to their community and to Grace Spring to one another. 
Father, as they move on, some going to college, some going into careers and other next steps, Father, Lord, I know that you're not done with them yet, and I pray that they would know that and hear that in their heart. Father, I pray that this isn't uh, just the closest that they've ever been to you, Lord. You want more of them, Lord. May they continue to take steps closer and closer to you. Father, in whatever their next steps are, would, would they look at your word? Would they ask for wisdom and discernment? And may they take the knowledge that they've learned and put it into practice. May they not disregard your word and your truth, Lord. And so, Father, I pray that they would continue to experience uh, just unconditional love and pour that out on the people that they surround themselves with in their next steps. May they experience a, a crazy amounts of grace and pour that on to others that need it, Father. Lord, Lord, the, the truth that they have uh, understood in their hearts, may they share that boldly with others. And Father, wherever they go, may they be unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And may they share that with all the people that they encounter. We love you, we thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Good job, seniors. Congratulations. Well done. I think Rob and the team are going to lead us in, in one more song, so stay standing and join us for that. This next song is one of my favorite um, songs because of the way that you all sing it. And I just imagine uh, the Lord must delight in the, the sounds of his children. Um, yeah, let's sing together.
God has been proclaimed today, and God's word, when opened, always demands a response. And I tell you, it's a very fitting response when we give of our time, our talent, our, our treasures, our resources, and it's a very appropriate way to respond because it's an act of worship when we do this. And so for those who have offering, want to give offering, you can do that digitally online, or you can uh, go to our baskets uh, before you, you know, on the exit doors. Uh, we'd love to just have you. Just participate in that act of worship, but also we have like VBS going on here in July, and this is a great opportunity for you to be able to share a story, and that is the story of you being a part of kids' lives and seeing kids come to faith, and uh, we would invite you to be a part of that. This is just a, a great way to respond to the greatness of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, and I, I also want to encourage you that starting next week, we are now starting a new part of the journey. Uh, uh, called Take to Heart. It's from the prophets as we start investigating and going into now the, the prophets here as our, uh, as our journey continues through the, book, the books of the Bible. So anyway, with that, we want you to join with us. We have this brand new growth guide available to you, free of charge out there in the concourse if you want to take one. It's got daily readings and all those things that can really help prepare you to hear the sermon next week. So we're starting next week on Elijah. So we want you to come back prepared to hear and uh, be encouraged by his walk of faith. So as always, we want to invite you, feel free to come up. We'd love to pray with you at the end of service. But as you go out, Remember, be a part of the mission of helping somebody, somebody, whoever God puts in your path, help them take a step closer to Jesus as you find yourself doing the same. Love you guys. Have an incredible week.